Well, hello there, woman beings, and welcome to another episode of the Woman Being Podcast. We are so excited to be here with you today. We are going to be talking about cults, about Gwen Shamblin, and a bunch of crazy shit. So you're going to want to <laughs> buckle up because we're just going to dive right in. This is Woman Being, where we explore thoughts and opinions and have the freedom to change our minds without expectation or judgment. We will hold a safe space and support each other as we navigate together in the form of feminine. We are so excited to be here today and to be talking with the one and only Megan Cox. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It is such an honor, such a treat, Mm -hmm. literally dream of a dream. Um, So women beings, if you don't know, Megan Cox is a cult survivor. She is the founder of the Beyond Zion Foundation, and she was also featured in the HBO docuseries, The Way Down, which we reviewed both part one and part two. So if you're interested, make sure to check those out. Literally, Megan, we (laughs) watched part two of your docuseries, and you mentioned in there that you had started a foundation to help cult survivors that are in recovery, it flashed up on the screen. And I was like, there's an email. I've just got to find this person. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we it's reached out. Like, so maybe <laughs> like ra- by some random yeah. stroke of luck, this person will be like, yes, I'll yes. come talk to you on the podcast because yes. we wanted to know more after yeah. we finished the series. Absolutely. And you were so kind. You were like, yeah, let's, let's meet up. Let's do it. And here we are. Here so we are. We're two so COVID cases later. Two COVID cases <laughs> later. <laughs> After many delays in recording, yeah. Yeah. we've made it. Yeah. We did it. I'm glad we you stuck it. with us all through that. <laughs> so part two of The Way Down came out this spring, and there's a lot that happened in between then and now. So how did you react to the death of Gwen Shamblin and other leaders? How did that hit you? Because you were involved in the Remnant Fellowship I don't know what to call it, ministry, movement, church. cult, church. Um, <laughs> and so how how was that for you? For me, initially, disbelief. Because, mm-hmm. like, no way, right? <laughs> right. How could that happen, like, after all this time? Um, but when I got the initial contact, like, saying, look what just happened, and I was like, not. Nah. So I Googled it. I never take things at face value. Mm-hmm. And it was all over the news. And it was just like early on. Like, mm-hmm. so there was barely anything known other than the plane crashed. Mm-hmm. But you could surmise that it wasn't good. And I, I, I think I might have stated this before, but I did get emotional. Um, not for Gwen, uh, but Jonathan and Jessica Walters, you know, I knew, I knew David Martin and his wife, Jennifer, and I knew Brandon Hannah, but the, the first thought to mine was, you know, I got emotional for them because they, they were out of all the people I liked, I liked them a lot. You know, they seemed very genuine to me. I even thought Brandon Hannah seemed genuine to me. Now that's just my perception and opinion. I know other people from that have left remnant feel differently, but and that's okay. But, um, you know, and we stayed a lot at Jen- David and Jennifer Martin's house in the beginning too, before we moved to Nashville. So like I had interactions with all these families and that's a lot of loss at once. Um, and it was just very profound. And I guess later on too, just processing like that did. And I've said, it's poetic justice, like that lake, and my mom keeps telling me no, but I could have swore like she had a houseboat on Percy Priest Lake because I got invited to it once is a special privilege. You know, I was showing mm-hmm. that I was being, um, uh, working on all my sin, you know, working mm-hmm. on being pure. And so I got invited onto the boat with my then infant son, who's now a teenager and it was on Percy Priest Lake. So her plane crashed into Percy Priest Lake. That's, that's how she went down, you know, her, wow. the arrogance took her down and, I I wanted at least to one day be able to confront her and go, what, what do you have to say for yourself? Like, how do you justify this? You know, especially, well, I can't now, but I didn't during that deposition in the first half, like hearing her say like, well, define many as far as detractors to her organization, like just that attitude 
you know, that flagrant disregard for how she affects people's lives because she has this many people saying that she hasn't been negative towards them. It just made me really angry. Um, yeah. But she answered for it, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah, it, it's sort of like a poetic justice, but also like really tragic. Yeah, 100%. Like any loss of life is super tragic mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I don't. You know, and I, I, I agree with Phil Williams and, you know, if, if someone terrible died, then like, let's not be flowery about it. Right. Um, you know, I'm sure she had her good, her good attributes, but mainly she's done a lot of damage to a lot of people. Yeah. And yeah. I, so I, I think that the way she went was perfect. You know, she went totally off the rails towards the end. You could tell yeah. outside looking in and, um, you know, everything she held dear just was gone, you know, and everyone else is left to pick up the pieces, which is nothing new when you interact with Gwen, but right. You know, right. To go down into the lake where you think it's a special privilege to bring people on your houseboat, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is, I mean, we just keep saying it, it is quite a poetic justice. Um, and I imagine there's like, a lot of complicated feelings and emotions that go along with that. Um, so what was your take on the documentary series as a whole? Like I'm sure you being featured in it slash also surviving this horrible movement um, that probably like you probably have some opinions. So I'd like to know them. <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking. Um, I do. And I don't want to speak. Um, I don't want anything of what I'm saying to be perceived as ill, speaking ill, but, you know, there was a lot left to be desired. And I think they knew that. I mean, they had been working on it by the time they got to me, like three years. Wow. A lot of people don't even know I was in the first three episodes. I'm like, no, no, I was there. I yeah. was used at that first interview. I sat for at least three hours and wow. just spilled out everything from start to finish. And they use that interview for just sound bites for the first three episodes. And again, I wasn't the only one. I know that. And they had a story to tell and they had to try to fit all of that in as much as they could. Um, I get that. Um, but it was, there's so much more to my story, so much more to all of our stories than just quick sound bites, you know? Yeah. Um, and even in that second half, when they showed clips of me compared to my second to first interview, like you can see a clear difference. I was terrified. Like I couldn't sit still the first time. Um, I was afraid to speak. I was so quiet. She had to tell me a million times to speak up. And the second time I was cursing up a storm left and right. I wish they would have <laughs> actually kept my whole tirade in. Cause they asked me what I thought about remnant statement to the docuseries. And I said, mm are we allowed to curse? Because I didn't know in the beginning and I tried to, you know, like quote unquote behave. And, um, I think she said yes. And so I just went off and I got really angry and it was very yeah. visible. Yeah. Um, the more I talked, the angrier I got because mm -hmm. I started thinking about, okay, they said this, they said this, they said this. And, and then I think, I don't know if it was by that time, I think maybe by that time they had also started posting videos of their members saying, Remnant didn't do this to me, blah, blah, you know, like, like body shaming and, yeah, um, yeah. you know, things like that. And then I think what really did me in was that all was really pissing me off. But then um, Elizabeth Shamlin's or uh, Hannah, um, her letter, it, it towards the, it's towards the bottom of the page. So if you don't keep scrolling, you don't see it. Just that's what really, that's what really got my goat. Um, I guess it's possible you could be so obtuse and so caught up in the moment that you don't really see the bigger picture. And I know it's her mother and I know a lot of people have a hard time speaking out against their parents. Um, but it, I just, they left out a lot and I understand they probably had to, and it wasn't an easy decision, but I, a lot of the feedback I saw was, I want to know more about the individual people. It ended up being an overarching story about Natasha and her child and, and, and which fine, that's totally fine. But, you yeah. know, I feel like the rest of us kind of got left in the dust a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, and not in a negative way, 
you know, we all took great personal risk to right. come forward. Right. Yeah. And now, now we're targets of their ire, remnants ire, mm. if, you know, so maybe that's another reason why I keep speaking up too, is because people want to know. So I'm going to tell. Yeah. I mean, there's so many factors that go into that when you're making something like a docu-series on what stays, what goes, what winds up getting cut, what makes the most sort of entertaining or cohesive story to like, you know, at the end of the day, they are trying to create entertainment, you know, mm -hmm. like they're making a series for HBO. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and if they're taking hours and hours of footage, oh, it's like, obviously they can include all that raw and edited mm -hmm. interview, but I'm sure there's so much good stuff in there. Um, and also, I'm not sure if we told you this, but you can definitely curse on our podcast. Oh, so yeah. cut Swearing <laughs> preferred. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, feel free. Um, but uh, I'm curious to hear from you specifically, like um, some of the things that uh, maybe you you wish had stayed in the docu series, or some of the things that uh, you you want to express that you feel like didn't get expressed uh, during uh, what was shown of your interview. I wish that they would have included the last time I went back to remnant with my child mm -hmm. and what, why I had to leave that mm -hmm. wasn't included. And I think that I understand they really wanted to drive a point home. And I think that they did, you know, that, that remnant is a cult and it is, it is not a good thing. And their, their, um, motives are not good. There, there's it, it becomes like it becomes worse because individual members can misconstrue the message to fit their own agenda and their own narrative and while they did tell that in certain ways i think like in how it worked in marriages they didn't really i mean and they did kind of like jacoby when she talked they touched on like you know how she gave up things but um i kind of just wonder why why if they're going to let those other people come forward and say, like, why didn't they include mine? You know, mm. I, but, but again, I can, I can't bite the hand that feeds because they did put forward the beyond Zion and like, they didn't have to do that at all. A lot of people didn't even know why I left. They, of course they were told something different. They, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell people why I left. Yeah. They would say it's, it's not for you to know, or it's, you know, whatever. And they tell people I left to run off with a boy and get married. And that's not the case, cool. although <laughs> it looks like it, <laughs> but no, I fled. I had to flee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, would you be willing to briefly give us some of that story of why you left? And um, yeah. we want to want to hold space for that here for you. Well, that, that's what we're here for. You know, it's like hearing stories of people said so, we want to know you know this is like a tell-all with megan cox it feels yeah. like, like ooh. <laughs> i spent a lot of my life split between two households um and in my mom's household is where way down workshop and remnant were introduced um my dad's household was a whole other bunch of mess um and so growing up Food or I was always controlled. Like my dad and stepmom didn't like me being chubby. So um, they would control what I ate. There was a lot of control with mm -hmm. what I ate, how I did my hair. Like I really wasn't free to explore um, who I was. I wasn't encouraged to find who I was or be creative. Um, it was all kind of decided for me or it was just, it's hard to explain. Like I was a very isolated child with my dad and stepmom. So some could say I've probably had daddy issues um, in the past, which I have. And mm. I just like, I remember being so hungry as a kid eating out of the trash can because they just, they just didn't want me to be fat. Like they would talk mm. about like drinking lots of water and eating fruits and vegetables. And doesn't yeah. it feel so good to be skinny and healthy? And I'm like, yeah, I guess, but I also don't want to be hungry. Yeah. So that's created issues for me, you know, like I'm still like almost 40 years old working through, um, being afraid to have hunger pains because mm -hmm. <laughs> I've spent yeah. all my life starving to up sure. to a certain point, you know? So yeah. then when I moved in with my mom, she had my youngest sister, Brianna in 96 and she discovered, I'm not exactly for sure how the way down workshop worked her its way into her life, but it did. And she started doing it and we all kind of participated one way or the other. And 
you know, if mom's doing it, we're all kind of doing it. She was the leader of the household and, you know, it made sense. I didn't understand the God part, but it made sense to me what she was saying. And I wanted to know more because I was so, I just was seeking love and acceptance and approval so bad because I didn't feel that I had that from either one of my parents. I was abused as a child, you know, in so many different ways, um, including sexually by family members and they didn't believe me. So I was desperate for anyone just to love me. And so if this meant getting my mom's love and approval, I was going to do it. And so I did. And I tried my best to understand church and, and, having a relationship with God and applying what Gwen said. We even went to some of her desert oasis conferences um, in Nashville uh, when in the early days, one of them, we met Michael Shamblin. He was just starting to do his music. Then mom always wanted to move to Nashville after that point, you know, to be closer to Gwen and way down because it had made such a difference in her life. You know, she had lost weight. Um, she felt she was closer to God and she even quit smoking Um, as well. So it was really the, the program was really working for her and um, it made her happier. And it just overall generally, it would work for the whole family. Like as long as we were applying it, um, the message and really talking about it and really trying to learn from Gwen, it it was working. So, and that's usually how it happens, right? (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. they come out with like, you know, something like some self-help or something that'll help improve who you are as a person and, and fulfill you and make you happier. Cause at the end of the day, that's all we really want. And, um, you know, that's how they find their target audience too, because that's how, that's the people you can, you can, um, ensnare. So mm-hmm. the time goes on. I'm, I'm a delinquent child. I'm not going to mince words on that one. Um, both my parents would agree that I definitely push the limits, um, sneaking out, uh, sex, drugs, all of it, just being crazy. Uh, I barely graduated high school because of attendance and just lack of caring at that point. And, you know, and all the while being told what is wrong with you, like your, your siblings aren't like this, you know, and I, cause I was the only one who also challenged my mom too. Like I wouldn't always take what she said or did. Like I would sometimes stand up for myself or challenge her back. And you know, that's not, that was how I was raised, like how remnant teaches you to be. I was already being raised that way and conditioned. And it's my mom didn't do that on purpose. That was just how she was raised and conditioned. And same with my dad too. I, from birth to, um, young adult, that's just how we were, had to be joyful all the time. Negative emotions weren't tolerated. Mm -hmm. Your autonomy is not yours. You do what I say, you be the person I want you to be. Um, you dress how I want you to dress. You listen to what I want you to listen to, Mm. you know, um, it was very frustrating. I, I had a lot of mental health issues that I wasn't aware of, and it could be either a genetics or B because of the sexual abuse and the mental and emotional abuse. I mean, who knows did the chicken, the egg, I don't, I don't know. All I know was I was struggling with ADHD and depression and anxiety and being told that, I'm being selfish and I'm a problem and I need to just focus more on everybody else. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get this right? Or why are you like this? The other kids aren't like this. And, you know, don't you just want negative attention? And I'm like, no, I don't. I just want, I I just wanted to be loved and accepted for who I was. Mm -hmm. I just wanted that love and support. And I wanted to find out who I was in a safe space during my senior year. And this was um, 2002. Mom had found remnant fellowship. Uh, Because Gwen had been doing tours, she had in 1999 founded Remnant Fellowship and had been doing uh, what she called rebuilding the wall tours. And she would, she must have been like contacting um, way down participants or putting it out there somehow that um, she had started this new church or she found the answer or something or other. I don't really know. And um, my mom went to the South Bend. conference, I guess, for lack of a better word, the rebuilding the wall and uh, conference. And she joined remnant her. And that's how the Marion chapter started because it wasn't just like my mom. It was all these people we had gone to church with for years that had known me since I was a baby. The other people in remnant knew who I was because mom was telling them about how I was just so lost and wayward and 
how she'd wish I would return to the truth. And I didn't know she had found the truth at that point. So, so I quickly plotted my escape because <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, no way am I doing this? This is not so. Um, and how are you going to switch like, uh, flip switches on me? I'm, I'm almost graduated. Mm-hmm. And now you're like, well, this is how we're living our life now. Well, you, I, I don't know if I accept that. Like, I think we had my graduation party, like June, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I took all the money that I had gotten from that graduation and went and got an apartment with this boy. I had started dating secretly and that was a disaster. Um, so this kind of cycle went on for years, 2005, I got pregnant with my oldest son, Ben, and, um, just was terrified the whole time I was pregnant because I had a really strong premonition. I was going to die giving birth to him. Mm -hmm. And that scared me because I was like, well, I'm not in remnant. I've rejected God's message. So therefore I'm going to go to hell. And what does Mm -hmm. that mean for my son? You know, I don't want to doom him to hell and I want to be a good mom for him. And I only saw the, the answer, the only answer I thought there was, was remnant. And, you know, I learned years later that this is indoctrination (laughs) So because I couldn't understand why I'd always end up going back because I, the guilt I felt all the time because I, I was turning my back on God and choosing Satan over God, you know, and I didn't want to be cursed. I didn't want to be a bad person. I mean, nobody inherently wants that. So went back, uh, was there, had been in the church, was there until November of 2006. Uh, Everything hit ahead that day. And um, my mom had accused me of something I didn't do. And I said, no, I, I, I didn't do that. And that made her really angry, which turned into assault, which then turned into um, the cops showing up and, um, Unfor- what the big unfortunate part of that was we lived in a neighborhood filled with remnant fellowship members mm. and um, they all saw the cops at my house and, you know, my mom had to come home and um, return the phone and everything. And then I had to make sure I asked the cops, I said, can you, can I, can I leave with my child and my car and my things? Can I, can I leave? And they're like, well, yeah. And I said, I just, you know, they, she tried to take my phone from me. You told me that was theft. She's, they've told me that they can take my child away from me because I'm not obeying. So that makes me an unfit mother. Um, so, you know, can she sue for grandparents rights? I don't know. Like, I don't know what could happen to me. You know, my mom helped me get the loan for my car. She could take that from me. And they're like, is it in your name? I said, yes. And they're like, no. So I like was so scared. And I'm like, they asked me for one to press charges because the marks were left on me. And I know they did take pictures, mm-hmm. but um, I said, no, I just want to get out of here. I can't stay here anymore. Wow. And um, I know I, I feel like I remember I said, I think I talked on the phone with Ted anger, one of the leaders, and then he's no longer with us, but Marcus Francis ca- came to the house as I was packing my things up in my car, ready to go. And, um, I was like, well, the only place I know is Ohio. I don't know anyone down here that isn't in Remnant in Nashville. He tried to stop me from leaving, said I could move in with somebody else, whatever. And I said, no, absolutely not. Like, this is not an option for me to stay anymore. Like, I thought they were going to physically keep me from leaving. I'm not. I was scared. I just wanted to go. And um, I did. I drove through the night with my newly minted one-year-old baby. Wow. home to Ohio. Uh, no, I mean, I had no home to go to. I had nowhere to go. Um, I just had like a very flimsy acquaintance that said, well, you could stay here. And I ended up couch surfing for a little bit until I married my first husband. That's quite a journey. Yeah, that is quite the journey. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm curious to dive in a little bit more to your experience at Remnant and hear some about like the toxic theology that you heard from Gwen or from other leaders in that community? Oh gosh, where do you start? (laughs) So the big thing, um, one thing that comes to mind right away is the women being submissive to the men always, Mm. no matter what. Um, And you have, you having to be submissive to any adult. Like I, again, almost 40, if I'm around anyone older than me, I instantly turn into a child and I know and it's something I've been working on. Like, okay. So like Ben's my, my, my son's oldest son's friend group 
like they're th- all the parents are older than me. I'm 38. I'm the youngest mm-hmm. out of all of the parents. And I used to feel really self-conscious about it. But then I started telling myself like, that's fucking ridiculous. Like you're an adult too. <laughs> and you, you have so much to offer too. Like you can't, yeah. it, you can't do that. And I've told, but I've been more open with them telling them that like, if I'm quiet, it's because of what I've been through. So like, it's not that I just, you know, I don't know, like just putting people on a pedestal in that aspect. Mm-hmm. I've really worked on. Um, so there was that another thing that comes to mind when we had our first, uh, church camp, um, outside of Nashville, um, a big thunderstorm came, which was very common in that area. Um, just thunderstorms that come up out of nowhere. And, um, it happened and we were in this pavilion having some kind of service or gathering. And Gwen said that that happened because someone was sinning in the camp. So we were all like prostrate on the floor, like, Oh God, I don't know what I did. I'm so sorry. Or like just really taking inventory of things that we thought we could have done that might offend God because of this natural occurrence that we had no control over, you know, that, that happens all the time. Katrina, she said that that's what New Orleans deserved because they were a sinful city. Uh It was a city full of sin. And I remember just kind of flabbergasted by that because I had a really hard time reconciling that because all these churches around us were like packing semis full of stuff to send down there to help those people. And I just remember seeing the devastation and they're still like, they're still trying to recover from that. Mm-hmm. And it's been like 17 years. Oh gosh, there's so much more. Um, women, I, I, I'm a busty woman and I had tattoos, but they're all in like my midsection so I could cover them. But I had to pre- try to do everything in my power not to be sexy. And mm-hmm. that's hard to do when you have gigantic boobs because you don't want to make your brother stumble. And that always pissed me off. It really mm-hmm. makes me mad now because I'm like, you're telling me a man doesn't have any self-control. So that put me in a constant. I was already on heightened alert around older men anyway because mm-hmm. of the sexual abuse I suffered. But then to yeah. put that in my head that I could potentially make them stumble. That I what the, I mean, that's like a powder keg right there. Right. Yeah. So you, you might be like walking around unknowingly like sending men to hell. <laughs> yeah. like, and that would be all my fault. Right. And I yeah. would be the one being punished for it right. yeah. or disciplined yeah. for it. So obviously, you know, you, any uh, excess weight you were carrying was visible sin. So one mm-hmm. service when gave um, it was kind of like, uh, I think she might even have included excerpts from the butterfly effect that movie with Ashton Kutcher, uh-huh. um, you know, and saying that, um, if we decide to be our own ruler and, you know, make our own decisions and take one bite over full, um, that could cause someone else to sin and it's a domino effect. And then something happens on the other side of the world and that's your fault because you chose to sin instead of putting God first. Oh and I was gosh. like, I was terrified. I remember writing that yeah. down going, don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Like the pressure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much pressure, but also at the same time, so much like narcissism at the idea yeah. that you're, yeah. you're affecting things all over the world like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and like this over, I think over like spiritualization of something like of very normal occurrences. Yeah. Right. Having an extra bite of food, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. have an extra bite of food and people in there's a tsunami. China die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. But also, those people deserved the tsunami. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. Like, what are you saying? Yeah. And I'm, right, I'm, exactly. Like, so terrible, right? Like, right. where's your humanity? Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm also wondering how would Gwen determine what excess weight is? Because watching the documentary and the, um, the footage we did see of her, she seemed to be naturally a very thin woman who also just didn't eat a lot from Mm -hmm. perception. And I'm like, so wait, are you saying everyone needs to look like you in order to not quote unquote be carrying excess weight showing your sin? I'm like, how is that even gauged? Wow. That's the thing. And that's actually a really good question because I'm not a hundred percent for sure either. I remember being at 19 years old, 130 pounds, like my hip bones were sticking out. My collarbones were very prominent. And again, no matter what weight I am, I have 
big breasts. Mm-hmm. It's just the way I was made. And yeah. they, Karen Sim, Sue Ruth, even my mom at one point all said to me, how much more weight do you have to lose? Because, <gasps> oh. yes, because um, Sandy Sheridan's daughter, Abby McDonald, moved down to Nashville and she lost more weight. She had already lost a bunch of weight, but she lost more because she was cutting her half and half. Oh so she was eating a quarter of her food. And that was like the joke, not joke. You cut your half and half. Like it was a joke. Like it eventually permeated through oh, no. other chapters, even before we moved down there in 2005. Yeah. Oh, no. That's so awful. I but- know. I mean, rail thin, like, Oh, look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it right there. She's, that's the ideal. She <laughs> She's is, emaciated. Yeah, yeah. It's terrifying. Like you can see like her skull and yeah. it's quite scary, honestly. Yeah. And like, I understand there's a lot of health issues that go into potentially being that thin or whatever, but f- based on what the documentary showed, it seems that she's choosing to be that way. And I'm like, girl, that's, that's dangerous. That's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I 100% agree. I mean, to any it to any angle of it is so dangerous. Like where I'm at now with my, um, with my journey, I have type two diabetes Mm -hmm. and I have high blood pressure. Um, you know, I struggle with eating and it just that I don't emotionally eat so much anymore. Like when would even make you feel bad for thinking about what you wanted to eat? You know what I mean? So like (laughs) for planning a meal, (laughs) like, Oh, I'm so serious. When would make you feel bad about wanting to chew gum in between meals? Like that's just chewing gum was just still committing the act of chewing your food. So Mm -hmm. like, don't even chew gum. I swear to God, you know, and this is like, I don't know if this is like, cause it was old school or how, I just will never forget these things are they're imprinted on me forever. Yeah. And it's that stuff that fucks with me still to this day, you know, and yeah. would I have type two diabetes? Would I be like this if it weren't for my parents and if it weren't for fucking yeah. Gwen? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I can't yeah. say, you know, but just that organization, instead of trying to encourage me to find help, clearly knowing there's a bigger issue, they just exacerbated it and made me feel like a piece of shit because I, you can't think of self thinking of self is, is bad. That's sin. Mm -hmm. You have to serve others and serve the church. So if you're being selfish, depression is selfish. Anxiety didn't exist. You know, autism Mm -hmm. doesn't exist. None of that exists. You, you can fix it if you just rely on God. Right. And that's a load of bullshit. I didn't know what depression was until, I mean, I figured out anxiety kind of on my own. Um, when my blood pressure started getting out of control, my doctor was like really concerned. And I was like, I'm, I'm anxious all the time. I, I, I think, I mean, I've looked it up. I think I have anxiety. So he told me to meditate and I was like, yeah, sure, buddy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so I tried, I, I genuinely tried, but that just keyed me up even more because I'm like, I can't do it. And um, so finally he put me on Lexapro and I, the, the piece that I felt like, you know, my husband's like, maybe you can come off of it. I said, never for anxiety. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I'm just an anxiety. My whole being is just like, sometimes even on the anxiety meds, like I still get anxious. That stuff sticks with you, you know, like, and it, it, it's like, especially, you know, in your sort of formative years, being subjected to all of this, like clearly toxic, untrue way of looking at the world. Like, you're kind of programming your brain to think a certain way and to kind of like pull yourself out of that. I mean, that has to be a process. And so I'm curious, like what has your healing process looked like? I mean, I think, you know, like finding doctors, getting on medication, like doing what you need to do to like take care of yourself is the most important thing. But like, um, what are some things that you have been doing or, or, or how has the process been of of finding healing? Very, long and hard (laughs) Mm. Um, because the, a lot of what I went through in remnant was very much tied into my childhood trauma. I mean, it was just the same if that Mm. makes sense. Yeah. It's like more of the same, but like backed up with God's word. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It was this. Yeah. And honestly, Right after I left Remnant in 2006, I actually met my now husband and my first ex-husband at the same time, like within the same week. And um, 
my ex-husband was all very much offering me everything I wanted, which was love, stability, and a family. You know, I wanted my, I wanted Ben to have a mom and a dad because mm-hmm. his dad and I didn't stay together. And, uh, and he, his dad had moved on to someone else, which I don't begrudge him. I knew it was going to happen, like whatever. And Remnant wouldn't allow me to date or get married because I wasn't pure enough. And mm-hmm. so, you know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't mention that, but that was a thing too. But anyways, that marriage, I'm sure it should uh, serve as no shock to anyone that it was not a good marriage. It was an abusive one. Um, we had no business getting married. Um, it was very much like, I thought it was so romantic that we were going to get engaged and married right away. And he loved me so much. And it was a goddamn nightmare. Um, absolute nightmare. It wasn't physical right away, but it definitely didn't take long. And, um, he was a prick, but I wasn't innocent either because I was really damaged. And sometimes I just made it worse, you know? So, um, he had me arrested for domestic violence. So I put my hands on him. I fought back and, you know, that's never okay. But I got thrown in jail for nine hours, worst nine hours of my life and got out and said, I, I need to figure this out. This is not okay. So went to counseling on my own. I had to fill out a questionnaire and she knew right away. As soon as I walked into her room, you suffered from sexual abuse and everything and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Oh my God, how did you know? And I completely lost it because that's not anything I'd ever faced before. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought I was lying about it. You know, I was told I was lying about it. Mm-hmm. And, th- you know, um, that all I do is lie. It, I just, so that was um, nice to hear for once. You know, that's, yeah. I, w- I was just shocked. I'm like, wait, so you, a stranger, can tell that. But my own parents still deny it to this day mm-hmm. that it happened. I only did that for a little bit because I was a single mom. I had to move back in with my dad and stepmom. So I didn't have any money and thought therapy was for fancy people with money. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't me. And (laughs) as much as I knew I needed it, but the sessions I did have were very helpful. You know, she had told me something really profound that I had never heard in my life before that um, just because their family doesn't mean you should allow them to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's actually really smart. Because after I left in 2006, my, my mom and stepdad, my siblings stayed in remnant. So there was still that manipulation going on if I did speak to them and there was still abuse going on through my dad and stepmom. Like they would make me think I was some psycho. It took a long time. Like I did a lot of self-work being with my now husband and taking time to really take inventory of what I am responsible for and what are the consequences of my own actions? What could I have avoided that I could have controlled by making a different choice? You know, owning my part in things and, and really trying to work through and, and try to approach situations more calmly instead of trying to be combative with everybody. How about, you know, I try to find a way to speak my piece in a way that can be heard instead of resorting to anger, you know, getting my emotions out, talking about my feelings Um, it was a very slow, slow process. Like I finally found a counselor locally that dealt with, um, trauma and things like that. So, um, that was right about the time I, people actually started wanting to hear what I had to say about remnant. Mm. And I was like, I should probably go get in with somebody and have like a solid foundation. Um, if I'm going to start opening up this can of worms, but I will say a lot of it started with me just saying out loud to people. I'm a sexual abuse survivor. I'm an, I'm just, I'm a survivor of things, all things. I suffered it. Yeah. I've survived it. I'm doing my best. I'm making the best choices I can. I'm really thinking about things. Like I was always trying to read and figure things out. And my husband's been very great, you know, teaching me. Um, he's been a very great influence on me. Um, does he trigger sometimes some things? Sure. I mean, it's marriage. We've been together for like a million years. So old habits die hard sometimes, but we're working on it. You know, he drives me up a wall. I do the same, but we've really come a long way, even in our relationship too. Like this is the first healthy relationship I've had and thank God I'm married to him, you know, Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) but it took a long, long time. I'm like, Oh, so I'm not a nut job. If you treat these things and talk about these things, it's fine. And I don't feel the slightest bit of guilt. I'm like actually mad that I was kept from this stuff. It, it's been a, it's been a long, hard journey full, a lot of hard uh, lessons, life lessons and taking long, hard looks at myself and going, am I the problem? Cause sometimes you end up repeating 
like the generational trauma, like the generational abuse, Mm -hmm. you know, and I told myself I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I did find myself repeating some of those things. And I started, I found myself um, mimicking things in my marriage and relationships that my parents would do. And um, they, some people call that like uh, in the Reddit, the subreddit nart raised by narcissists, they call that fleas. So you do adopt traits Mm -hmm. of your abuser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't like that at all, but it was Mm -hmm. true. So that was tough to kind of look inward and go, Oh God, like yuck. But the difference you got to take accountability for it and move forward. It's not pretty. It's the ugliest journey I've ever been on to become a better person and Mm -hmm. to heal from all this, but I'm grateful. Not everyone gets this chance, you know, or I have a lot of privilege. Yeah. I mean, you have so much to be proud of yourself for. Thank you. I agree. In in the steps you've made and and the things that you do. I mean, like it's, it's so hard to accept that you need help and to find that help and to, you know, Mm -hmm. to depend on people when, when for so long you've been in survivor mode, you know? Yeah. That was pivotal for me. I had no idea I was living in survival mode and it took me a long, long, even after I figured it out, it took me like at least a couple more years to finally get out of survival mode. Thanks Megan for sharing all of those things. And like your, anyone's healing journey is nonlinear and takes so many different paths and turns. And so um, it's fascinating to hear about the the aftermath and um, the pain that comes from all these different forms of abuse, including the spiritual abuse from a place like Remnant Fellowship and that theology that, that sort of seeped into your family and your mom's side. Um, so I'm curious to hear coming coming off of that a little bit about um, Beyond Zion, which uh, is the foundation you created uh, as a result of all of this, uh, and hear about sort of what you all, um, what you, what you do, what kind of, what kind of work you're doing and um, sort of the, the mission behind Beyond Zion. Oh, thank you for asking. So (laughs) I was, filming in LA for the HBO docuseries uh, in, I think it was March of 2021. And they had said something that just kind of was very profound to me that all of the survivors of Remnant are so scattered and a lot of them don't have contact with other survivors. I was at the point where I'm like, I'm ready to get this all out. Like I I can't hold this in anymore. It's got to come out. And just knowing that people are out there doing this on their own, you know, even for me, like, I I guess my goal is to just be that person I needed over 15 years ago. I needed someone to tell me that I, my feelings are valid, that I am valid, that it is going to be okay. And that we're going to help you make the right decisions. There is hope. There is a life outside, like, because you become so infiltrated you know, I didn't know how to function in the real world anymore, which is crazy because I wasn't completely out of the real world, but that's how much control they had over me. And I didn't realize it until I was free of it. And then said, well, oh shit, you know, what do I do? I I don't know. Like, what is this? What is any of this? Like, I knew you had to have a job to pay the bills, but Mm -hmm. everything else I was blissfully ignorant to. And, um, that's so damaging to people. And it's so damaging when people are around you going, well, what's your problem? You know, like, why can't you just get this right or figure it out? Like that's been, a, if you haven't guessed already, that's been my whole theme of my freaking life is the people closest to me that should love me and support me are like, well, you're stupid basically, or, you know, whatever you can't figure it out. There's something wrong with you. There's not, I just had gone through something really traumatizing and had no one that understood. And I found as the years went on and the more I was willing to be open to healing everything that I went through, the more I wanted to be around people that could understand it and finding people that understood and talking to them. I was like, Oh, Oh my gosh, I'm not nuts. They can validate me. Like um, the generation cult podcast was really integral in that. Um, Just me starting to identify why I thought remnant was a cult. Okay. When she did some interviews with Scientologists and a few other cults, like, um, they would talk about like things they went through. I'm like, oh, I went through that same thing. Oh, they did. Mm-hmm. The remnant did that to me, you know, just kind of like ticking off all these boxes. And um, 
I was like, why aren't we all together? Like we're stronger together. Why are we cowering in fear from this organization? This is nuts. So my goal is to be that person you can come to for reassurance to get it all off your chest. But then if you, if you need counseling resources, okay, great. Where do you live? Let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, let's walk through this together. Here's what I found through Google reviews and everything. But, you know, um, I always tell them I can do all this for you. I can help you find all these things, but it's up to you to take the next steps. Mm -hmm. I can't do it for you. You know, I help with, um, I'm not a legal anything. I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm not a lawyer in any sense of the word. Like I don't know the law, but I have a lot of really great resources that I can reach out to. If I have any questions like that, um, I do have like a whole file of legal advice, especially for custody issues. I've had people come to me for that. And, um, you know, being able to be in survivors together to help that parent win a decent amount of custody, if not full custody of their children to keep them out of remnant. But there are some sad cases out there right now where this woman, um, she lives in North Carolina, has been fighting for custody of her children for over 10 years and has documented abuse. Oh, wow. I, parents that are in remnant and she can't get custody of her kids. Like the court sides with the ex-husband every time. Oh my God. I've got a GoFundMe going for her to raise money. That's basically what I do. You know, I I'm your safe space. I do investigate calls. Like I, I can kind of like tell people from what I've learned from remnant and my research and everything. Mm -hmm. Like I can say, that's a call. This is how you should proceed, you know, or totally. if it's out of my realm, I, um, Ashlyn Hilliard has her own organization called people leave calls where she'll help do counseling and stuff like that. So I'm the curator of resources. <laughs> basically, well, that's, that's so powerful what you mentioned. I mean, ha having resources and having been like, I've walked through this before and I know the way, like here's mm -hmm. a map. Um, but, but on top of that, being able to say like, oh no, I went through that. And this is what my experience was like. And mm -hmm. people being able to identify with it yeah. is so powerful. I, I think that's like a huge piece of what we've done on our podcast and what we've done with some of the people that we've had on is they've talked about experiences that they've had in the church or like with weight loss or, and things like that. And they've said, this is my journey. And in that you're able to identify, you're like, oh wait, that happened to me too. And it hurt so bad, but I didn't have words for it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in, in a sense, that's what you, what, that's what this documentary I think accomplished is, is being able to put words to like, hey, this type of behavior is not healthy. It's not uplifting. It's not normal. It's not godly. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Mm -hmm. And so one question I had for you was, what are, what are to you some of the top red flags that you see when identifying cults or when people are questioning whether they're in a cult? Some that I've found over the years are very blatantly cults, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of them are subtle. A, a church that actively wants to plant other churches, like to spread their message. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, that I don't love that. Like just, and this is just initially if you're looking into it, but if like you're visiting it personally, if their message is, this is the only way. Um, this is God's truth. I don't know where I saw this, but it was a church I uncovered early on in research for a scripted reality series about cults that it's in Ohio somewhere, Greenville maybe. And the leader of that organization said he is God. Uh, Boy. Run. Oh, no. No, yes. yeah. <laughs> Anytime an organization says it's us against them and the world is wrong and we're the right way. You know what I mean? Like totally. um, if they're dangerous. trying to isolate you from your family, if they're trying to take up all of your time, mm -hmm. um, if, if they are seriously all about you, like the love bombing in the mm. beginning, like they just want to spend all their time with you and invite you to all these places and get to know you and it's going to fall off. It always mm -hmm. does. Those are some major red flags. Basically, here's how you can sum it up. Look up the red flags of an abusive relationship. And that's exactly what cults do. Mm -hmm. um, they're very hand in hand. And I used to think I was trivializing it by saying that, but I've actually found a lot of cult survivors do agree mm -hmm. that um, that's why I say, if you can't find a counselor who is who specializes in cult abuse, like spiritual abuse, Find a find a, a counselor that specializes in trauma. 
because there's not a lot, unfortunately, there's not a lot of counselors that are well versed in, in called abuse, but I'm hoping that'll change. But anyways, yeah, red flags. Anytime someone says us versus them, mm-hmm. tries to isolate you from your friends and family and by saying that God said to do that. That's what God wants you to do. Like if you can't question any of it, or if you ask questions and they get weird, well, the big things are control. Mm-hmm. If they're trying to control any aspect of your life, if they're all up in your business right away, and if they start trying to tell you what you're doing is right or wrong, I don't know, like those for sure. And the us versus them thing is a big red flag yeah. too. I mean, that control thing can be so hard to identify, you know, because it's so subtle and it's so manipulative Mm -hmm. that it feels like it's for your benefit Mm -hmm. or it feels like this is about like what's good or what God wants or, you know, any number of those things. But 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 learning to realize like, oh, those are just tactics. Mm -hmm. It's often very well disguised, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Eventually, what I would love to do, like my dream would be to go to high school's across the United States and just speak to these kids Mm -hmm. and let them know, you know, because I don't, and I'm not putting parents down. I teach my kids this because I know, but I teach my kids to question everything. Yeah. Don't take things at face value just because someone's an adult doesn't mean they know better. Mm -hmm. Um, And to think for yourself, trust your gut instinct. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if someone's acting a little hinky to you, be careful, you know? Um, I I think it's important that kids learn that. That's why these things thrive because people aren't like listening to their gut or trusting themselves Mm -hmm. or even like the gaslighting that they can receive is like, oh, but why would you even ask that question? Do you even believe And it's like, whoa, whoa. (laughs) I mean, I remember pulling myself out of a very controlling, manipulative friendship in high school. And I remember that my number one feeling was like, nobody told me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, nobody's teaching anybody how to, like, identify these things or, like, when to, like – Le- like put your guard up <laughs> because mm-hmm. things are not ex- like you know and and all of those things happen to me like being kind of isolated from my friends kind of subtle control like religious ma- manipulation like all of it is kind of like enwrapped up in that but at the time it felt like oh no I I have the secret knowledge of something you know mm-hmm. or like I'm somehow above other people or it's it's sort of like a narcissistic way of looking at life Mm-hmm. That I mean, anyways, yeah. So, all of that being said, thank you so much for sharing. That's really powerful. Yeah, and I think really helpful for other people to have. I mean, a lot of our listeners are either active in Christian communities, deconstructing or post deconstruction, and so I think those things are really helpful to have, like on your mind as you interact with different faith leaders or even your own family, friends, people in your circles, and so. Those are good tools to have in your tool belt, I shall say. But kind of going back a little bit to Remnant, we're in the aftermath of the documentary, right? We've got more and more people coming forward like yourself, resources coming up like the Beyond Zion Foundation. I mean, it feels kind of like everywhere you look, something's going on, but Remnant is getting very quiet um, in some ways. Uh, Elizabeth has not left her home Uh, that we have been able to find for quite some time. Um, And Gwen is no longer with us, the leader. So I'm curious to know, in your personal opinion, Megan, where do you think this is all going, right? Like, tell us your theories and what you think is next for them, because it's really hard to tell at this point. Like, it's kind of like a sealed off, like, happy facade that no one can really penetrate. Yeah. And they've always kind of kept it that way. I'm not surprised at that at all. I mean, I, I've been quite curious myself exactly where it's going to go. Um, and just how Elizabeth's approach to everything after she's left my heart truly does go out to her. I feel so much compassion and empathy for her, her, losses have been unfathomable. Yeah. She's buried a child. She's buried her husband. She's buried her mother, mm-hmm. you know, and her brother has left the organization. Her dad's not in it. Like, I don't want remnant to continue. Like, that's not my want. Do I think it's going to disappear? 
No, because if as long as there is anyone who believes mm-hmm. and buys into the message, and like Adam Brooks said, as long as money can be made, yeah, you know, th- it's not going to end. Like I'm realistic in that sense. I think a lot of people thought after Gwen died, like Remnant was going to crumble, and I was the only one going, "Nope, nope, <laughs> yeah. it's not, it's not." Are you kidding me, Gwen? was the most calculated person. Do you really think she was going to leave behind um, I'm a mess? Like, mm. of course, she's going to make sure her legacy lived on. I think she's a very smart woman, to be um, honest. She was a very smart businesswoman. That is clear. <laughs> 100%. And, you know, I admire her for that. But it has been dwindling. I, I would be shocked if there was ever an influx of new members, especially mm. after so much being out there strong now. Mm-hmm. like th- about remnant there's never really been anything concrete mm-hmm. at least there's always been a little bit of survivor chatter here or there there's a lot of bitter people out there about remnant which i don't hold that against them mm-hmm. but i'm one of the survivors that chooses not to continually bash it mm-hmm. um because it makes me no better than them in my personal opinion so they're yeah. going to continue on i'm going to continue on and live my life And, um, they're going to, they're probably watching me and everything that I'm doing, or maybe they're not, I don't know, but they took delight in like HBO stock falling. Somehow they got a, a clip of Elizabeth saying that she's been praying for her enemies to be uh, struck down. And she took HBO's stock drop as a sign that God was hearing her and trying to defeat her enemies. Interesting. Here's the thing, Elizabeth, it's going to go back up. I'm like, oh, baby. (laughs) So like, okay, for instance, for me, right, Ellen and I have been the two most out in public about it, like talking out against remnant things like that. I made a whole organization dedicated to helping people from remnant. Like that was the whole reason. But I'm like, well, I can't just be for remnant. I have to be for everybody, right? Like yeah. remnant's not the only one, but maybe they watch me. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Um, but like they could take things like, okay, for instance, I'm overweight. So that's. I'm choosing sin. Like I've chosen Satan. So how am I, how am I credible because Mm -hmm. I'm overweight? How am I credible? Because I have tattoos and piercings and, you know, um, I smoke and I drink and, um, you know, I lost my job at Ulta. Um, that was God punishing me. That's how they would turn that around. You know, my son got hurt in football. Um, That's God punishing me. You know, my sin is now leaking over to my children. Consequences are because of my sin, you know, so how can I be credible? Look at how my life is cursed, right? They would Mm -hmm. take, they would do that. That's how they would spin my life. But it's a joke because in the real world, if you are set in reality, like life naturally ebbs and flows with good and bad. There's always good and bad consequences, regardless of what choice you make. Things are just going to happen. There's nothing you can do. I can be a bitter and angry person. I can do that all day long. But how does that serve me or anyone that needs my help? It doesn't. You know, they can drink that poison. Yeah, I I refuse to do it anymore. So um, they're not going to, if they ever grew again, I would fall over dead. But um, I hope Elizabeth decides to turn away. Yeah, I really do. She deserves it. She deserves a life that's her own. I don't think her life has been her own since ever. Definitely. And I definitely share, I mean, there's so many characters from, I I guess I shouldn't say characters, so many people from the documentary that I'm curious about, but I find myself most curious about Elizabeth um, now. And so I definitely share your empathy um, and well wishes for her. But And honestly, your um, self-advocacy in the form of responsibility is very admirable. Like the way you have taken so much responsibility while healing, while going through your journey is like really inspiring. And we always hate like coming to the end of an episode, especially with guests such as yourself, um, because I feel like you just have like so much wisdom to share and your story is just so compelling because it truly is that of a survivor. But all that to say, Megan, we love to ask this question to all of our guests, but 
I have to know your answer, and it is, what does the phrase woman being mean to you? I've thought long and hard about this, and the word that always comes to me when I think about what it means to me is um, free. Mm. Freedom. Mm. Peace. (laughs) Having that for the first time in my life just is amazing. That's beautiful. It is beautiful. And being of one's own accord. It's so, it's something I feel like we all deserve, right? Like no no matter, I feel like no matter what you've seen or been through, I'm like at some point in your life, I, I hope everyone gets that opportunity to feel free and to feel peace. I like that answer. It's very good. Um, So as we're kind of wrapping up, What resources do you have to share with our listeners? I mean, it can be anything, documentaries, uh, such as the one we have reviewed, Mm -hmm. or books or articles. What is there anything in particular that you feel like people need to know about? The GoFundMe for this sweet woman trying to gain custody of her children. Um, Throw them all our way. Yes, uh, I have a GoFundMe currently going to help this woman finally regain custody of her children and free them from remnant. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. I did outline in it that I because their children are minors. I've kept everyone's identity. Like I have to keep it under wraps. Um, Absolutely. Yes, it's important. You know, because I also don't want remnant to get a leg up on it either. You know, so they. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. uh, But besides that, um, anything by Dr. Janja Lynch. Or Lalek, excuse me, not Lynch Lalek. Janja Lalek is amazing. Uh, cult, cult News 101, fantastic resource. ICSA, International Cultic Studies Association. They have so many wonderful, they do conferences. They um, have so many wonderful resources as well. Um, Ashlyn Hilliard, she runs the organization People Leave Cults and she works um, on cult recovery as well, like helping um, families work through cult issues. I, there's more like, I don't want to say exit counseling necessarily, but it's something along those lines. And I'm probably not even doing it justice, but whatever she's at the helm of is amazing and super helpful. I can say that much. Deanna Levy's podcast called Generation Cult is amazing. So if you, if you've ever suspected or think you may have been in a cult, listening to those survivor stories, because Deanna herself is a survivor as well, is very helpful. Um, if you're trying to ex- like explore those waters and just think about it. But I, I want to be clear that while I am a white woman, um, I do, I can help you find the resources you need if you're a person of color, if you're LGBTQ plus, like any of that, mm-hmm. like I've got you, I'm open-minded. I love you. You're all amazing. I advocate for you, but um, cause it's important. I think they tend to get left behind a little bit. Yeah. Um, especially from what I noticed, like Helen got a lot of shit on Twitter after the second half release mm-hmm. to the point where I kind of had to hop in and go, what the hell? Like, come at me like that. Not her. Are you kidding? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then Helen kind of explained it to me and I was like, oh God, I wasn't trying to be the white Jesus, like the white savior, you know, like I didn't, she's like, well, you're not. And I said, okay, good. Like, I felt kind of bad afterwards. I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we learn, you know, <laughs> I was like, I guess I should have just like asked you instead of like being like, leave her alone. Well, and I will, I usually always do my utmost best to post, like as soon as I get any new or additional resources, I try to post those on my Facebook page and I'll post it on my website as well. I'm sure I have some, I might even have some of these links to the resources I've given on that website as well. But if not, I'll make sure to have those posted. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And we'll totally, we'll include all of these resources that you're recommending in our um, episode description and, uh, everyone will be able to find them. Everyone will have access and to be on Zion. So, because I'm sure people will want to find you. Well, Megan, I feel like we could podcast for at least two more hours (laughs) and just like, thank you so much for your time and your willingness and how, like, how kindly you offered to share your story with Mm -hmm. us um, and with the listener. It's so, so, so valuable. And I know that there are people out there that have experienced very similar things to you and this will greatly help them such a gift yeah it is really is with all that to say i think we're just gonna wrap up for today um and womb beings make sure that you are 
following us on Instagram and TikTok. We constantly have conversations going. And I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong, but the original review of this documentary was actually a listener-recommended topic, mm-hmm. I think. It was. So you can be sending us things to talk about, things to review. People We are interview. always here for that. Mm-hmm. Interviews. Um, so yeah, make sure you're following us. Give us a review and send us a message because we want to hear from you. And with all that, we'll just see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.